Thanks, thanks all of you for coming. <clears throat> I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we gather as settlers on the occupied traditional lands of the Yolamu Ohlone people, including the villages known as Petmono, Sitlintak, Chuchui, Amuktak, Tuxite, and Omparomo, whose sites are within the boundaries of today's city of San Francisco. The Ohlone people are still present on this peninsula and we live among them today. So I'm going to focus this evening on the history of communications infrastructure, especially infrastructure that isn't necessarily visible to the unstudied eye. We think about history, we've tended to think about recorded histories, histories that are built on or inspired by documents or by artifacts. But in recent years, as many of you will know, historians have also opened their minds to working with unwritten histories, such as oral histories, oral traditions, as understood in many native indigenous black communities, or testimonials, as understood in the Latinx tradition. And tonight, I'm gonna to throw you a bit of a curveball and also talk about unrecordable histories, histories where there isn't a lot of evidence to back it up. And when we think about communications, it takes us into the realm where much isn't recorded. We're going to see evidence about how communications infrastructure built up in the city, starting uh, shortly after the gold rush era and taking us almost into today. We're only going to hear a little bit about the messages that that infrastructure carried. And you know what's because suppose you're listening to the radio, unless somebody somewhere is reporting off the air, the only place that that history is going to be recorded is in your mind and in the minds of other listeners. This, by the way, is our emergency warning siren system with um, uh, some red tails nesting at uh, Taraval on the Great Highway a few years ago. They had to uh, turn the, the sirens off. That was happening. And the idea of infrastructure that you can't see goes back a long way. You know, maybe even as far as latitude and longitude, which is sort of virtual infrastructure. But for most of us, infrastructure brings up thoughts of bridges, railroads, aqueducts, pipelines, roads, piers, pretty massive things. And um, in fact, while communications themselves are pretty invisible and weightless, they're enabled by physical networks that take up a lot of space and absorb a lot of investment. As we would say uh, in, uh, in school where I teach, they possess materiality and all of the majesty and the inconvenience of materiality. So we're gonna talk about communications infrastructure and San Francisco hardware, a little bit about the messages. I'm gonna focus on telephones and radio, but I'm also gonna be talking about other modes that wind in and out. This is not a systematic talk. We could do the whole evening, we could do the whole year just on telephone infrastructure and the history that's built out. Telephones are deep. You know, you can't understand the internet without understanding telephones. In the same way that you can't understand telephones today without thinking about the internet. So this is really a little bit of a hodgepodge and a great tradition of you know, amateur local history. It's things that interest me, things that are also part of my longer term research on communication history. One little warning, I'm not gonna talk much about broadcasting, radio and TV produced to inform, to entertain or to sell. These have rich histories. I'm gonna talk a bit more about useful radio, radio that has a job to do and personal communications like amateur radio, CB and, and cell phones. And you could argue that useful radio is important and it's mostly unknown. It's sort of the pulse of the city. It's deep infrastructure. So telephones haven't been invented yet. How do you communicate? You could write a letter. You couldn't send a postcard that was too early. You could call for a messenger. Uh, a telegraph boy, perhaps in the facilities of the American District Telegraph Company, and many offices, businesses, and houses have direct connections to the telegraph company. You actually pull a, uh, pull a line allowing you to call for a messenger. 1853, we see telegraph lines connecting the city with San Jose, with Stockton, with Marysville, with Sac, 
in the same year they extended a wire over the dunes from um, the merchants exchange near here and telegraph hill to point Lobos lookout so that they could signal news of incoming ships that was valuable monetizable information 1859 there was a telegraph line made to la so that the stages and stagecoaches that came in to southern california which carried news that news could then be telegraphed up here and then um uh, uh 1861 the transcontinental telegraph was completed and interestingly enough Telegraph 1861, telephone not till 1914, 15. It took that long to move from Morse code to voice. Uh, it's 1877. This is a time of massive unemployment of drought, of anti Asian violence. Telephone service comes to San Francisco. And you know, if you go back, you can often find a correlation between times of social and economic unrest and the deployment of communication systems. And you can see why the telephone was attractive to captains of industry, it could give them information instantly without mediation. What's happening in my factory? What's happening you know, with my supply lines? Why are the miners striking? But the telephone, it took time to, to take hold. And at first it was a really odd system because you couldn't call the operator. There's no way to ring the operator directly. You had to first signal the telegraph office, which happened to be in the same room as the switchboard, and it would tap out the fact that you wanted to make a call on a tape, and the tape was passed by a telegraph operator to a switchboard operator who knew to connect you. Really kind of kludgy. And until about 1880, the operators were teenage boys. These looked like sophisticated kids. Um, their language was considered unseemly. Hello, hello, what do you want? Are you through? Well, why don't you hang up? Uh, this was one reason why you know, they, they were trying to find women with mellifluous voices after a while. There were two competing telephone companies in San Francisco. Later, there was a third. Um, they were separated by patent disputes, but they combined in, 1980, in 1880, choosing the name Pacific Bell Telephone, which you all know. And we built a new switchboard at 220 for What did they do with the wires? You know, in those days, they didn't know how to put multiple communications, route multiple communications over a single wire like they do today. You know, one fiber line can serve a whole city. Um, so they wired, they put wires on the top of the house. Most roofs downtown had a frame supporting telephone and telegraph and messenger wires. And in residential neighborhoods, they'd actually nail a board to the roof that would lean out over the project out of the street. And wires were in the open so people could inspect them. And rooftop wiring turned out to be a pain because people had no laundry on it. <laughs> people working on the roofs would trip over the wires. Um, 1880, telephone poles came into being and they immediately got really really tall and out of control that's an engraving but there's a or the pictures of it was this way in every city uh, streets were dusty though and wet dust mixed with fog to blow onto wires and short them out and typically that evaporated by noon in san francisco but it was hard to make calls in the morning um so interesting to see these kinds of environmental issues played in technology. This is, of course, famous picture from 1906. Um, we see no telephone wiring, and that's because um, underground cables were installed downtown in 1892. This would be decisive because it meant that they survived the plague and the fire, even when all the, the buildings, the switchboards, and the wiring in the streets uh, did not. Um, the, the, the city had an underground grid to build on. Uh, constant innovation, constant reinvestment. Telephones to San Jose in 1883, that year also to Oakland, the Bay Works, as they used to call it, the Misha, and then later on to Sacramento, to Santa Cruz. Um, this is just for the fun of it. In 1895, all the telephones that could talk to each other fit into a single book which we have in our library, you can look at it. Um, I always love it if you look in Washington. Then this book is a picture of the ruling class, you know, in, in America in 1895. It's actually a great read. And if you go to Washington, you can see Professor Alexander 
Graham Bell, the inventor of the telephone. You can call him at Washington 32 if you want. Um, but this book only goes from Maine to St. Louis because there was no telephone service that reached further than that. Um, it only was 950 miles. So by the 1890s, this, by the way, is a chart from 1881 to 1927, 1891, really. Um, businesses were into the phone in the 1890s, but the general public thought they were frivolous and expensive, kind of like cell phones in the early 90s. Pacific Telephone decided you know, it was party line where many subscribers would share a line and each would have a distinctive ring. 1894, you could get a four-party line or a 10-party line. And in 1896, they came up with a, an interesting innovation called the kitchen telephone. This was geared towards, towards women. For just 50 cents a month, which was a huge discount, you could call out over food and supplies for the house, but the phone had no bells. So so you couldn't call it from outside, which is really interesting to think about Victorian ideas of gender roles. This is really cloistering, you know, in many ways. You can't call in, you can call out. Um, and with a kitchen telephone, sometimes there were 20 other phones on the line. So it's pretty um, low grade service. Um, and the idea was to make customers discontented so that they would desire real phone and this sort of worked. By 1905, there were 50,000 phones in San Francisco and after the plague, in fact, we became one of the most connected cities in the world. I think we had the highest per capita number of phones of any other city. So 1906, uh, the quake and fire destroyed much service. Most service, this is the first temporary phone directory. Uh, I don't know if you can really see it, but you know, it's got the Mission Relief Committee of Southern Pacific Hospital still awake, phone still, I guess, because it was outside the zone. And then um, this is uh, October 1906. By that time, and I love the temporary numbers. Um, engine company number 11 is Butcher Town, 18 Butcher Town, <laughs> phone exchange. Um, by the end of 1906, there were 29,000 phones in the service. In 1907, the service was back to normal, which is astonishing. We need to work really, really hard on that. And some of these phone numbers that haven't changed, by the way, are that on Fulton Street, the San Francisco Pet Hospital. It's the same phone they had in 1907. Uh, West 8312 is now 939. Infrastructure challenges. Um, you see, here's the operators sitting on barrels, the first post fire switchboard. Downtown was mostly destroyed. Most of you know that businesses relocated to the Fillmore and the mission, hoping these neighborhoods hoped to become big retail districts. A lot of people left. I mean, this was a good time for many working people, especially in the trades, because their labor was in such demand, they were getting paid more. So many people moved out to the periphery, began to populate the outer neighborhoods, and it meant that the phone company had a hard time uh, expanding service. Many of you have heard about the Chinese telephone exchange. This was established on Washington Street prior to the 1890s. Um, for some years, it was kind of a, uh, a segregated system, you'd have to say. It wasn't interconnected with the rest of the system, and it served only Chinese subscribers. But in 1896, it was connected to the main system and remained that way until 1906. Um, and in 1909, they built that Orientalist structure, which has been a tourist attraction. This is a, a feature film outtake, maybe from the late from Shanghai, I don't know, of the Chinese telephone exchange. Um, this is the directory. Both male and female operators had to remember everybody's name, 1,500 subscribers and where they live. Uh, they knew all the languages spoken and all the different dialects of Chinese. They also, the phone system was also a way by which labor was contracted. Employers would call with job offers and operators would know who to route, route them to. I don't know if there's been a deep study of this, but um, there's much to talk about with the Chinese uh, telephone exchange. There's also one in Oakland that I've never seen anything about. This is from 1922 and it's uh, small, but it's just one person. Number one. 
other things were happening too. You know, so today we have AT and T and Comcast. You know, that serve us with cable and telephone service delivering programming. Um, there were about ten companies in 1913, including this one, mostly in the East Bay, that started up. And the idea was to transmit music, songs, S O N G apostrophe S. Lectures, speeches, operas, sermons, and vaudeville over the phone. Um, they don't seem to have survived past the demo stage or the demos of Cadwell's. This is like a wacko idea. And so it seems like it is, but in 1881 in Paris, they were already offering stereo in 1881 with two phone lines to serve music up. Um, and in Budapest in 1893, a radio over telephone service was started that actually lasted until 1944. It lasted until almost the end of World War II. Um, some applications, the hospital, receiving news at the office, entertaining features for the children. Um, you know, they hadn't resolved the speaker entertaining guests, the hotel open. They hadn't resolved the speaker problems. So you still have to hold something to your ear. But this is one of these great, this is like deep media archaeology because you can find the, the, the seeds of the future and the past. In other words, the idea that there's a copper wire coming into your house that could be used for more than just telephone. It can be used for entertainment. It can be media in a broad sense. This is such a, a contemporary idea. Um, this is sort of a much loved story in the, the Ball of All Nations, which happened in May 1914, prior to the, the PPIE. Pacific Telephone was asked to furnish telephone service. And in this immense hall, they built a hidden network of wires that were connected with copper nails in the floor that were set together closely. And a woman whose name is Mrs. George M. Van Buren, the spouse of a telephone company employee, wore shoes with copper soles, and then wires ran up through her gown to a telephone set. And you could dance with her, with Mrs. Van Buren. And she would ask who you'd like to talk with. And then um, suddenly they would be on the phone. A switchboard operator eavesdropped on all the conversations. And whenever they heard a name, they rushed through a call on special lines so that you could dance with Mrs. Van Buren and talk to anybody in the United States. Um, this, somebody should make a documentary about this. This is um, from a film made in the 30s about the completion of the transcontinental telephone line. I apologize for the sound, it's bad in the original. Um, so this man up on the pole was, none of these images are very real. I don't think these are all reenactments. This is one day where you come, this man is Ralph Knudsen, known as Luke, who later lived in Berkeley. The man on the top of the pole, who later started a telephone museum in his home, where he would show the original branch that he used to bolt the 
it pulls together. Um, I, I just learned about this the other day, but I'm, I'm very curious where it's developed from because it is now a lot of interesting stuff. One of the things when you start looking through all the clippings, you discover all of these small historical museums all over the place and wonder what happened to the collections. Um, that's 1914. Um, but the big celebration happens January 25, 1915. This is San Francisco. Alexander Graham Bell is talking to Watson. And he says, Mr. Watson, come here. I want you to bring this classic message. And Watson says, it'll take me five days to get there back. It took five operators to connect this, and it took 23 minutes to actually make the connection from all the different across the country. Something that's not well known is that there were many calls made that day. Um, and I'm especially interested in a call between Wu Kung Shu, who managed the Chinatown telephone exchange, and Wang Wai Su, who was the Chinese passenger agent for the Southern Pacific in Boston. So many communities, I think may have been represented uh, that day, but that history is largely not told. So it builds up, we have a second line in 23, the southern route of 30, northern route in 27, and a fourth, but long distance was not, look how much this cost. So San Francisco to Boston during the day, $17.25 for the first three minutes. Multiply that by 14 to get the calls to the phone call. Um, and think about what this service sort of meant socially and economically and politically. And if you think that's bad, this is from May 1929. Here's the international rates. Spain, $63 for three minutes. Again, multiplied by about 14. I mean, 63 times 14, that's like $800 for three minutes in today's dollars. So, um, uh, these were carried by radio, and they, they were certainly expensive. This is, to me, fascinating. It's, there's a, a reason to believe that this service was established as a means of legitimizing AT&T as sort of a natural monopoly, which was their thing. But here we're reaching out across the world, but at the same time, this is an ad from AT&T in 1920. And it is such, this was widely this appeared in many, many magazines and it comes out of that World War I period of nativism, xenophobia, and anti communism because it advocates um, that uh, if we're a one language people, this makes for national strength and national progress. It's very anti foreign, anti immigrant, anti non English. And then also, says, the telephone best serves those who have become one with us in speech. So basically, we should only talk English. Um, which I think um, 1922, we have a 1922 phone book in the library. It's a wonderful document. Look at that exuberant typography at the bottom, taxi, exclamation mark, like lettering, blown up balloon-like lettering. But if you look inside, there's some ugliness. This is the um, heading under laundry, the publisher of the Yellow Pages, which I think at that time was still the telephone company. It might have been Ruth McDonald. They made room for headings like Laundry's White Labor. And they took ads from what was called the Anti Jap Laundry League. It says Laundry's listed under this heading employ white help exclusively and deserve your patronage. Separate listings uh, for Japanese and Chinese. Laundries. Um, so uh, obviously, serious struggles going on there. It's the Pacific Telephone is essentially putting their imprimatur on racism. Um, if you look up to laundries, which you can't see from here, but the Galan Mercantile Laundry and the Troy Laundry and the Linen Supply Company are located at 301 8th Street, which is exactly the space that we occupy today with the library. So our library uh, is the heir to this, this space devoted to laundries that are played on the white label, which is an interesting thing to think about. Sorry about the volume.
So, um, you know, this is an important moment, I think, in a lot of ways, because um, for really the first time, you can reach out quite a ways without any mediation. On a whim, you can contact somebody else. And it certainly anticipates the way that we think of communication today with the internet, with chat, with text, whatever. This is 1951. It took a lot longer before you could do this in a lot of places, but Englewood, New Jersey did it first. And for a while, San Francisco was area code 318, but not for very long. Uh, there's a huge expansion of suburbia. This is six years later, 1957. You can't really see, but all these wonderful exchange names, you know, uh, uh, there's plenty of places you can look at that. Those of you who do deep urban research know about address phone directories that list telephone subscribers by address. If you don't, come visit us sometime and use ours. This offers an amazing glimpse of who is on, in neighborhoods, but you have to be careful because the spread of telephone service was very uneven. Um, but this is a prosperous time in a prosperous city and just to look at the names. Like for example, if you look at um, Third and Howard, Fourth and Howard, to understand who was really living there, who was doing business there in this neighborhood that was supposedly a slum that was torn down to build Moscone. 1960, Pacific Telephone followed the lead of AT&T and said, we're gonna go all number on our call. We're gonna get rid of the central office prefixes that many people love. There was a lot of protest in San Francisco. The anti-digit dialing league was formed. Um, S.I. Hayakawa, the semanticist, who later, you know, um, uh, was head of SF State during the strikes. Melvin Belli, you know, right around the corner. Um, and a lot of other people, I think there were about 3,000 members. Um, and it was a typical San Francisco thing, you know, it was kind of like Carl the Fog. It wouldn't happen anywhere else. Um, and there was editorials against it in the Chronicle and the Examiner. There was poetry when you know they you can uh, you can see this. Um, I can see Megan uh, thinking this is from the Thurgelson collection. A man named Norman Thurgelson, who was a music teacher in the Concord Public Schools, clipped the regional papers starting in about 1954 until this year. And he made these scrapbooks, topical scrapbooks, many of which come from papers that are not digitized, like the San Francisco Progress and other things. And we have in the library about 150 volumes of these scrapbooks, which are an absolutely amazing resource. And you know, they're kind of solved, they have kind of written things in, and they're all, some of them have many layers. You know, but if you're working on local history, spend some time with Mormons books because it's the most accessible way of addressing the right. matter. Phones start to move away from wires. Here's an early car phone, one operator, 
maybe just one connection in one city later on in the 60s. You could maybe have four or five connections at once. Extremely expensive. Remember the first cell phones, bricks that you would carry around, they're collectible now. Um, cell phones started about 1983 and they become popular, as you know, in the 90s. I don't know if you remember, but this is from um, the late 90s. You had to have a book if you traveled that told you how to use the cell phone network in different cities. You had to pay money to establish service. Like if we buy travel to San Francisco, I'd have to pay two or three dollars a day and 50 extra cents a minute. These books you carried around. It was extremely laborious. Lots of education was required. There's a little <laughs> flyer from the 80s telling you to do both cellular and cordless phones operate with a battery. You know, there's a wireless etiquette from the late 90s, that, um, which of course are lost. <laughs> Absolutely lost. Okay, enough about phones. Here's something that I think is really important, but also pretty geeky. We're very fortunate, in my opinion, to still have a functioning fire alarm system in San Francisco. It goes back to 1865. It's its own wires. It survived the earthquake. Um, it's, uh, it's a 19th century system that's um, clunky, but it actually works. Uh, when an alarm comes in, you know, somebody like pulls a box uh, and then inside the box, which need to be wound up every so often, there's a kind of clockwork operation, a coded wheel that sends dots and dashes over the phone line. If you have box, I don't know, there's a list of some of them, uh, Pier 5, if somebody pulls the box at Pier 5, it will send out nine uh, dots, then I think 10, and then five. And then this is red in the fire alarm at the central point. And then there's a, a pre-established um, uh, set of equipment that is sent out for fires. So a pier fire, certain equipment would be sent, a house fire and the sunset, different equipment. Um, and also there were special calls for emergencies and for the chief and so on. Um, this is how it works. This is from the streets of San Francisco, season two, episode 20. So, I mean, that actually is edited weird because the tape is shown last. But in, uh, in, in many ways, the system, you know, it's, it's computerized now, but it still works the same way. They don't work with the box numbers anymore, but they're assigned to area numbers. So, if something in our area is reported, they'll send out a certain number of supervisors and an engine and an ambulance. And all of this um, works. You know, we've got a really amazing. Uh, our department, this is again this book from the 40s in Playland, had a box on Balboa and on Carrillo Sutra Baths, had their own box. Um, these boxes function through Loma Prieta, the quake, most of them, they're still 2040 on the streets. 80% of calls are false alarms, 20% are legitimate, but the system is hardened against disaster. This is the console today, or a few years ago at 1011 Turk. A couple of, just before the pandemic, the fire department asked city residents, do you want to get rid of this system? And people actually said, we care that they're here. Um, not only because it was a sense of tradition, but a lot of people and also a lot of fire officials feel that they offer a, a, an alternative to cell phones that are going to go down immediately in a big disaster or to the increasing number of people who don't have landlines. So um, there's a maintenance issue with these, but um, I think we should try to keep them keep them going. It can often be that we, uh, we, we ensure the future through 
of the technology. Yeah. So I think starting about two years ago, I saw that the fire boxes are all covered and out of order. They pulled a few of them, but I think it's just a few hundred. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm told that it's not all. In my neighborhood, that's the That was true. Gone, but no. We had that problem in our neighborhood as well. Um, there's also a system not a lot of people outside the city know about these red phones. It's called NATS. This is the mayor's emergency telephone system, which is controlled from 1011 Kirk Street. It's not part of the phone company. It's its own copper wire system. It has backup generators, and it's in the mayor's house and the supervisor's house and in every fire station and in a lot of city agencies. This is a phone book for it from the 90s that I published that information anymore. But it's a fascinating backup system. And there's also these old police call boxes which are tied in with this system now. And as of at least 2012, and I don't know if any of you know, uh, maybe some of you are police officers, but each rookie cop up to at least 2012 got a key to those blue boxes when they graduated from the police academy. So radio, um, I'm gonna speed up a little bit on this. People are starting to feel tedious, but um, radio is as old as the universe. It passes through everything, including our bodies. We're still hearing, if you know how to tune into it, cosmic noise from the Big Bang. And it sounds like this. Those are all natural radio sounds. They're not birds uh, or frogs. Um, if we were to reconstruct the history of the 20th century through wireless, it would begin. This is what's called the dawn chorus. If we reconstructed history, we'd then hear dots and dashes. We'd hear the early radio amateur operators with code and voice and music in 1909. We'd hear regular transmissions from San Jose, supposedly the first broadcasting in the United States, which became KCBS. Many years later, we wound up KCBS. San Francisco has always been a radio pioneer town. This is 1899. Military, the Navy, radio amateurs, the newspapers. The Spanish-American War has ended. California volunteers are coming back. And this is a huge newsworthy event. And so they set up a radio receiving apparatus at the Cliff House to receive transmissions from Lightship 70, nine miles outside the Golden Gate. Uh, and the code transmission comes through and that San Francisco call is able to, um, to, uh, to, to be the first for this news that the troops are coming back. I mean, 1899, that's two years before Marconi's signal seven years before the break and fire, astonishingly early pioneer. Um, youthful wireless operators in San Francisco, this is unreadable this way. If you go back to the Chronicle online, you can kind of sort of read it. But um, you know, the high schools had radio clubs. Lowell was a pioneer. The colleges had radio clubs. They're kind of like posse. Some of them feuded with, with one another. The San Francisco Radio Club, which Meg and I are proud to be members of, was founded in 1909. It's still flourishing, very active in emergency and disaster work. The ham radio hobby grew very quickly, and it was lightly regulated. And kids got involved. And any time kids in media get ahead of something, get ahead of adults, there's always a moral panic, you know, uh, like TikTok or some college students at Berkeley and Stanford were fighting radio wars with each other, and they were interfering with marine and government stations, you know, because actually everybody shared the same few frequencies. Radio in the hands of the youth was deeply threatening. And this article from 1908, rivalry of college men, a source of trouble to the wireless station. This directly led to federal regulation of the airwaves. It wasn't all a boys club. This is Jack Gladys Kathleen Parkin, who was born in 1901 in Bolinas, moved to San Rafael before the quake, uh, lived in San Rafael and Oakland. She was the first successful female applicant for government first class radio telephone operator's license, which was not easy then and now. It's still very hard to obtain. And she got her license when she was 15. She lived till 1990. 
and there are many other early uh, women who worked as hand radio operators. There's a German website that shows hundreds of them, and we're talking people in like 1908, 1909, 10 years more, more than four broadcasting. So this is an article that rhapsodizes about the excitement of wireless and talks about the adventures of a commercial radio station on Russian Hill, not broadcast, remember, to send news and telegrams and so on. But what's interesting here is who wrote it. It's Rose Wilder, the daughter of Laura Ingalls Wilder, who at that point was here writing for the call. Um, and it's, it's uh, you know, Rose is an amazing and controversial character, one of the biggest uh, exponents of libertarianism in America. Um, but this is, it's kind of great to read her pieces. Um, she's really into technology. Uh, she would have done well working for Wired. Um, some of you may remember CB radio. This is far too much to talk about. This was huge. I was here in the 70s. The CB bands were humming. There's a CB card. These are cards, uh, QSL cards. That, Operators would share with each other um, when there were messages. This is how I had 14 Valencia's names. They get familiar uh, to me. These were, I have, we have thousands of these, but these are the other two from San Francisco. I put my hands on this one. You know, it's from the informal era of CB pilot, Mustang, or Palomino, Whippoorwill. FCC there is in a little boat to, to kind of uh, arrest illegal operators. And I guess this. Person's handle is Birdman of Alcatraz. Look at all those antennas. Um, hard to tell the story of this time. Community wireless networks. There's a bunch in San Francisco. Our, our amateur club runs San Francisco Wireless Emergency Mesh that provide connectivity during emergencies and disasters for free. SFN from Internet Archive is another. And this is from the Cauliflower Collective, if any of you have done. Um, research on San Francisco counterculture. This is a still functioning sort of ghost of the collective in the Mission District that started by was it Irving Rosenthal, um, was a, a refugee from the University of Chicago, hippie commune, and they did this um, cauliflower newsletter to share news between communes. And sometime I don't have the date, and then about 68, they're talking about communes connecting by citizens' band. Radios. One way to hold our thing together, whatever it is or may be, is to bind it together in a common radio network. Um, this is something I'm doing research on. It's a pretty interesting topic. Um, TV has always been a huge problem in San Francisco because of the hills. This is the Norm Thurkel scene there. But the article begins here and then goes on to here, and there's the picture. But the information is there. There was cable TV. Uh, you had to pay 1960 very few subscribers. Something had to change. 1962, Mount Sucro Tower is suggested. And uh, the Chronicles TV station, KRON, says this is a matter of the community's aesthetics. The proposed tower does not belong in that area. Uh, so, you know, as always in San Francisco, everybody's fussing and fighting when it comes to building anything. And um, this, by the way, was the old Sutra mansion. Lori, I was telling you about this, that uh, was, was Mr. Sutra's mansion. This was a transmitter house uh, for one of the TV stations. Um, it was torn down. Uh, and this is what the tower's artist conception. Oh, was it really? So, you know, somebody should do like a full talk on Mount Sutra Tower, that would be really nice. Well, you know, that you could cook the food with the radio frequency energy <laughs> coming off. Of, you know, this, that's the most lethal electromagnetic radiation probably is at those TV frequencies. It's no accident, it's way high. 1973, um, uh, many TV stations in the FM, et cetera. This is a map. You can see this online of who's up there. I love the the sort of, uh, you know, this is like the London Underground, what's working and what isn't, um, et cetera. So 1930s, sophisticated wireless infrastructure in place. It's militarized in the 40s, like the whole Bay Area is militarized. There's naval transmitters all over the place. Um, 1929, KJBS, which is an AM radio station, starts to broadcast police dispatches to cars. And the police phones bulletins and there's a sergeant 
was detailed to the radio station. He gets a call and says, okay, put this out. The announcer has a police siren under the desk, plays it out over the air and meets the buildings, the police cars. And the next year they start doing it. This was a big hit. It wasn't, uh, it was mainstream, this idea of eavesdropping. And um, uh, this is a guide called the, uh, the Homograph. It was a radio guide for the Bay Area that came out every month. This was a short wave of local programming, early FM. This is 1948, but it's great. They also used the police radio stations. And San Francisco was at 2466 kilo, kilo cycles, a terrible frequency because um, it was assigned all over the world. So uh, when a lot of times when um, uh, it would interfere with, with stations all over and getting dispatches that were meant for you know, El Paso, Texas. 1957, after years of fussing around, they finally get police radio system nearly ready and took years to get it up and running. Um, uh, 19 later in 57, the dispatchers with a rich south of market brogue are being heard in Mexico, Texas, and Florida. The Havana, Cuba Police Department is saying, get off our channel. This is already VHF, and this ran, the, serve, the system is actually still in service uh, for part for disaster response. It's a backup system, but you know, the characteristics of VHF radio, it skips all over. This is what it sounded like, 1979. Yeah, this is for the punks in the audience. The cops are being called to the Mabue Gardens for a disturbance, right, in 1979. And now in 2000, they built a new system. They built a beautiful new emergency management headquarters next to the old one at 1011 Turk. It looks like this. It's a pretty orderly uh, place and everything's computerized and you know, something's called in, this is what the dispatchers see. Uh, you know, we'll go through all this. You can see this kind of thing online. But basically, um, radios and computers work together as a means of uh, deploying the movement of people and equipment. Here's a map that shows sensitive locations in Venezuela, the consulate, the Charles Schwab, and so on. Um, this is, there's a whole, uh, if you call, for an ambulance, there's a whole triage thing. All the protocols are computerized so that everybody deals with everything the same way. We've got a new system being built. I won't get into any of this, but it's extremely interesting. Um, starting in 64, American cities are rocked by civil unrest. Uh, some people call rebellions, and money flows from the feds to local jurisdictions to fund riot control equipment. And this is when each cop gets a walkie talkie um, and systems get a lot more sophisticated. And the existence of communications triggers an interest in intercepting them, as well as all these people who want to practice listening to the, um, the struggles in American cities as a sort of entertainment. I mean, this was the radio that I had when I was, you know, I was 18 years old that I listened to SFPD when I moved here at 71 plus dollars. Um, and I also listened to a lot of other things. Here's a little tidbit of the audio from August, 1979. It's from a, a special task force of the FBI. It was the special operations group. This was a special FBI task force that worked out of the produce, one of those um, uh, rental spaces in the produce market in the southeast part of the city. And I just found a court document that explained why this happened. And it was that Hells Angels had so many contacts in the police that they were able to buy used police cars surplus 
with them, make sure that the radios were still in them so that they actually have the opportunity to listen to police and FBI on their own equipment, right? And, and this is in a, a court uh, uh, affidavit issued by an FBI agent named McKinley. And so this is why they were in this special sort of super secret task force. Um, this is just to say that so much of this unreported and unwritten history is covert. Uh, and it's cryptic, but it's still incredibly interesting. And in many cases, we can only imagine. Listen to this, for example. So those are just... Um, This is also the FBI, and what they're doing is they're in situ, uh, they're uh, surveilling suspected spies under foreign diplomatic cover, and they're staking out the old Soviet consulate at 2790 Green, and they've got an elaborate code system uh, with these letters that are like coordinates and probably also geared to specific people they're watching. We would not hear this happen now because everything has been encrypted and, and scrambled. Um, but uh, it's just an example. This took me years to figure out what this was, but I became convinced that that's uh, what it was after a while. Um, but this infrastructure then and now contains much information that will never be clear never be revealed, and it poses a very interesting challenge uh, to historians. Um, this is just data traffic in 2000, uh, with $25 a month, you could get 150 kilobytes of data. It's like one degraded Instagram, a traditional <laughs> kilobyte, 20 cents, you clean out your bank account quickly. So I'm gonna end with just a few very general sort of historical technical notes. Um, movement to like one of the things very hard in history, radio and communications infrastructure spreads out from the center, systems become complex, much more secretive, natives, uh, networks monitor the movement and behavior of people, both commercially, you know, like when you walk into Walgreens or walk into um, uh, my friend Philip Nordstrom, if anybody still does that right now, who are targeted, especially your Bluetooth phone, you know, is sent out, is picked up by beacons that, uh, that know where you are and your preferences and where you spend time. If you ever wonder why you see certain ads on your Facebook, uh, that may be why. Um, and then there's all these new networks that are part of urban infrastructure that we don't know very much about the gunshot detection systems that are all over the city. Volvo observation platforms have automatic process plate readers that are all over the Bay Area. I'm not sure we have them here. Face and gait recognition, the one way to identify somebody very positively is the way they walk. Um, uh, video feeds that come into uh, intelligence fusion centers and so on, observing cell phone metadata. If you read about January 6th in DC, this is how they're busting a lot of people by their telephones linking location information. Um, and the last thought is we need to make a choice between convenience and fragility. We love our cell phones, but that network is really fragile. It goes out when it's heavily used. It goes out in disasters. And everybody's mostly all gotten rid of their landlines where they've got their phones coming in through Comcast, which if you don't have a surge suppressor and a battery, you know, you're dead. Um, so uh, historically, we have a lot more data. We have a lot more functionality. It's very, very fragile. And we don't know we're in the in the dark when it comes to security and privacy. I think we're going to start seeing the rebirth of messengers and couriers. And, things like that. <laughs> and this is Newline's, you know, Newline, terrible company. They have fun catalogs. This is their drone delivery. Anyway, thank you for your patience. Uh, thank you for All the staff who's made this happen and also helped out with the audio and technology. And uh, I really appreciate it. And uh, thank you.
And if any of you have information on any of this stuff that you know more than 